Hello, I'm Regid Ahmed with BBC World News, our top stories. Free to walk away, the civilians of Manbij in northern Syria celebrate as so-called Islamic State is forced out of the town. I'm Julia Carneiro live in Rio with news from day eight of the Olympics, including the ban of the only track and field competitor from Russia. A state of emergency in the U.S. state of Louisiana as heavy rains cause what's been described as unprecedented flooding. He was the actor inside one of the world's most famous and best loved robots. Kenny Baker, who played R2-D2 in the Star Wars films, has died at the age of 81. Hello and welcome. Hundreds of residents of the northern Syrian town of Menbij, who were used as human shields by Islamic State militants, have been freed. There have been scenes of joy and relief as they celebrated their freedom in the streets. The Syrian Democratic Forces, a broad alliance of fighters who were backed by the US, captured Menbij on Friday as the IS fighters fled. Alan Johnston reports. The joy of liberation in the streets of Manbij, celebrations at the end of Islamic State rule. She praised the Kurdish and Arab forces that drove out the militants. May God salute you, she said. You are heroes. All around in the ruins of Manbij, there was huge relief. For many months, the militants laid down rules on every aspect of life. Now the beards that were compulsory could come off. Some women even burnt the veils they'd been compelled to wear. And stories of the harsh realities of IS rule began to emerge. This man said the militants cut his hand off after accusing him of stealing a motorbike. This roundabout is where executions were carried out. Severed heads used to be left hanging up here for days. The Kurdish and Arab fighters began their offensive more than two months ago. They had help from U.S. special forces on the ground and help, too, from the American-led coalition in the air. There were weeks of fierce street fighting. Mambij was hugely important to the Islamic State militants. It straddles a crucial supply route that linked them with Turkey and the outside world. For IS, the loss of Mambij is a major blow. Now the people of this battered place have a chance to rebuild and begin again. Alan Johnston, BBC News. Well, with me now is Foaz Georges, Professor of International Relations at the London School of Economics and author of ISIS, a History. Uh, Foaz Georges, thank you very much for your time. Let's start in, uh, in Manbij. Now, this is good news for the town, but how much of a difference is it going to make in the, in the overall fight against Islamic State in Syria, given there's this wider context of a civil war against President Assad? Well, I mean, it's a major setback for ISIS. ISIS is bleeding. ISIS is losing. This is not the first city that it loses in Syria. The idea is the American-led coalition working with the uh, Syrian uh, local forces, the Syrian democratic forces. It's a coalition made up of Kurds and Arab fighters. The idea is to squeeze ISIS. The idea is to tighten the news about ISIS and isolate ISIS and then go for the kill, Iraq. But this is the beginning. This is not the beginning of the end. Because even though, I mean, most of the reports talk about uh, Manbij being somehow it's going to uh, end ISIS, uh, access to the world is not true. ISIS has two major cities on the Syrian Turkish border, Al Bab and Jarablus, as important as Manbij. So, this is the fight goes on. It's a long, complex fight, but the fall of the city represents a major setback because also Manbij is an operational center for ISIS to send basically operators to carry out attacks in Turkey and in Europe as well. But is it really possible to root out Islamic State? Given these fighters, often when they lose an area, simply move on to another area. Even if you could win against IS, you still have people fighting against Assad. It's a very, you're asking really two important questions. One of the lessons we have learned about ISIS or IS, the so-called Islamic State, it's fighting to the bitter end. 
This is not a house of glass that's collapsing overnight. It has taken the Kurds and the Arab fighters 78 days to take over the city, along with more than 600 American airstrikes. The Americans basically carried out about 700 airstrikes. The city is destroyed. So the question is, yes, you uh, capture the city, but at what cost? Not to mention hundreds of fighters have been killed, Kurds and Arabs, and hundreds of civilians. And the fight goes on. Not to mention, as you said, the second question, you have a bigger and more complex fight inside Syria between the Assad regime and the various, of course, opposition forces. This is a very costly, very long. This has been more than five years. You're talking about 300,000, I mean, killed and on and on. Let's just turn quickly to what's happening in Afghanistan and Islamic State. We know that the, or we believe, we've been told that the head of uh, Islamic State in Af Afghanistan and Pakistan has been killed by a drone strike. How much of a difference is that going to make? Well, his name is Hafiz Khan. He is the Amir of the so-called Islamic State in the eastern part of Afghanistan, the so-called Karasan group. But guess what? This is not the first time that an Amir of ISIS has been killed. The Americans since 2014 have killed the Amir, the deputy Amir, the religious scholar, and the spokespersons. And every time the Americans say that this is going to disrupt the uh, uh, ISIS operations, and the operations continues, more than the killing of the Amir of ISIS, the internal fighting within Afghanistan between ISIS and the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, this particular internal fight will, really move, will do more damage to ISIS than the American kill killing of top leaders. Fawaz Georges from the London School of Economics, thank you very much for your time thank and you. analysis. Well, let's get all the latest results now from Rio on day eight of the Olympic Games with Julia Canero, who is in Rio. Uh, Julia, uh, first of all, let's just start with this banning of the last Russian to be competing in athletics. Tell us about that. Thank you very much, Julia Canero, for that update in Rio. Well, let's have a quick look at the medals table on day eight so far. The Hundreds of people have been rescued in the U.S. state of Louisiana, where at least two people have died in severe floods following heavy rains. The governor has declared a state of emergency as authorities there brace for more heavy downfalls. Chris Fawkes from the BBC Weather Centre gave us more details. It's well, let's take a look at some of the other stories now. Seven people, including a young child, have been injured in Switzerland when a man attacked passengers on a train. A 27-year-old Swiss national is said to have started a fire on board using flammable liquid before stabbing passengers with a knife. The incident occurred near Salaise in the canton of St. Galen. There's no indication yet as to a motive for the attack. Sweden's youngest ever government minister has resigned after being caught driving over the alcoholic limit. 29-year-old Ida Hadzialik was Minister for Higher Education and was the country's first Muslim government minister. In an emotional statement, she described the incident as the greatest mistake of my life. Thousands of Venezuelans have been crossing into the neighbouring Colombia to buy supplies after the border was officially reopened. Venezuela had closed the frontier a year ago, citing security reasons. The country is experiencing a severe economic crisis and suffers shortages of many basic foods and medicines. The Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro, said he wanted a new beginning in economic and commercial relations with Colombia. Well, our correspondent Natalio Cozoy in Colombia has been monitoring the situation on the border. Well, I'm well, stay with us on BBC World News. Still to come, Leicester City begin their defence of the English Premier League. And it wasn't the best of starts. BBC World News Today, I'm Regid Ahmed, the latest headlines. Free to walk away, the civilians of Menbij in northern Syria celebrate as so-called Islamic State is forced out of the town. The governing body for World Athletics bans the only Russian track and field athlete at the Rio Olympics, long jumper Daria Kleshina. 
The father and first husband of a British woman who was killed in Pakistan have appeared in court in shackles. They were arrested on suspicion of murdering Samia Shaheed, a beautician from northern England who was found strangled in a village in northern Punjab last month. Her second husband has described her death as an honour killing. Shaima Khalil has more from Islamabad. <laughs> The poisonous relationship between Russia and Ukraine reached new lows this week. First, Russia accused Ukraine of plotting a sabotage attack on Crimea. Then, Moscow announced it had moved a sophisticated air missile defence system onto the peninsula. The White House is urging both sides to avoid escalating tensions. The BBC's Tom Burridge sent this report from southern Ukraine. It's well, let's go to Hugh now for all the sports. Hello, Red Ed, Premier League champions. Thanks very much, Hugh. Now, uh, let's tell you about this rather sad story. The actor who played the robot R2-D2 in the Star Wars films has died at the age of 81 after a long illness. Kenny Baker, who was 1.2 metres tall, played the character in The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, as well as the three Star Wars prequels from 1999 to 2005. Kenny Baker's nephew, Drew Myers Co., looked after him for the last few years of his life. We rarely... Now let's just give you a reminder of our main news. Hundreds of residents of the northern Syrian town of Menbij, who were used as human shields by Islamic State militants, have been freed. There were scenes of joy and relief as many of those celebrated their freedom in the streets. Well, that's it for now. You can get a lot more on our website, bbc.com forward slash news. See you soon.